now, broadcasting live from the banks of the Niagara River, live from Sessions on the River, it's the Jim Fannin Show. Ready? We're rolling. We're rolling. Thanks very much. It's the Jim Fannin Show. We've been here all day. We're doing Fans on the Hour, and we've got a tight show planned for you today. Thanks to Aaron Burr for tuning up there and getting all tight. Matthew James Blake is in the booth, the back. Uh, thanks for the beautiful introduction, and we are live from Sessions on the River right here in Fort Erie, right on the banks down by the Peace Bridge. We've got, as I said, music on the hour, every hour, right till midnight tonight. So uh, a little bit, we're, this is the first show in two years. It might be a little bit of rusty, so that's why I call in the bigwigs uh, for political guests. So two years off, uh, since that time, I've run in a couple of elections, one municipally for mayor in St. Catharines, uh, not really to win, uh, running as a perpetual Green Party candidate, and winning is never anything that I you know, invent as a possibility, unfortunately. Uh, it's about bringing better conversation to the issues and about calling these guys on their inauthenticities of the, you know, the major political parties. Uh, Green is... Uh, you know, a party that doesn't change their policy with the wind like these guys do. So for uh, so the last couple of years, I've been doing that and staying busy lately, uh, not because of my hard work, but because of a hot real estate market. I'm a hero more than I've ever been, selling stuff for way more than we ever thought it was worth uh, in record time. And again, that doesn't make me special. The market is pretty hot right now. So I've been spending some time doing some real estate. And I'm right in the middle of launching another business that I actually can't talk about yet. But uh so busy, busy boy. This has taken a couple months, two and a half months, maybe of hard work. Thanks to Chris Curry. He's the uh, owner operator here at Sessions on the River. We've got a liquor license for 140 people. Hopefully we'll get close to that later. We've got a good crew in the house now. Uh, so the idea was, you know what, do a show that focuses on the music and the issues and my shitty political takes will come into it as well. So, and my guests, shitty political takes. Uh, we don't have a management here to answer to. We don't have our corporate overlords that say, hey, you can't talk about Marineland. It's no hold barred. Uh, we're going to go and talk about whatever we like. Uh, one issue that's uh, near and dear to my heart right now, although I'm not really actively participating in, the, uh, in it right now, is this uh, PSW issue. You know, uh, we, Some have said we sold our soul to China and Niagara Falls. Uh, with this huge development on Thundering Waters, a really important uh, wetland and forest. And so uh, our political guest tonight can speak to that kind of stuff. So we'll go hard at that. Um, so first off, Gord Miller is my first guest. We'll get uh, him up in a second. I'll just give you a quick rundown just because you know, he thinks he's coming up. But not yet. Gord. Um, so Gord Miller is a former environmental commissioner of Ontario, 2000 to 2015, I believe, 15 years Pointed uh, by multiple different stripes of government. You know, uh, there's a guy that's um, walked the political line. He's got so much deep knowledge. He's been a, an expert witness and testi testifying. And some of these, oh, we're just moved the PSW next door, five blocks over. You can't fucking move an ecosystem, man. It's just so Gord will, Gord will speak to that a little bit. So I'm really happy. He's made a drive in he used to made a real effort and everyone that's participated on the show thank you very much the artists and guests included um uh, i'm honored to have you here so gord miller is my first guest that we're going to bring up then the leader of the green party of ontario mike schreiner uh i like to call these guys friends we've actually had beers together talked about things that you can't talk about on air well we can talk about anything we want today but uh, as a leader of the green party i can appreciate if he's got to walk that politically correct line sometimes uh, so we'll bring him up. Greg Vesna, on the other hand, is a guy that has locked many political lines, hung himself on a few of those lines, maybe. I don't know. Uh, Greg Vesna is the founder and chairman of a company called Hydro Fuel Inc. Uh, did you know you can burn ammonia as a fuel and we can make high, uh, you know, electric power from it? It's uh, exhaust is water vapor and then you can make it in your backyard. So Greg hasn't had the easiest time getting that out of you. There's no money in, hydro, in hydrofuel, is there? I don't know. Uh, so it's not the 100 mile an hour or 100 mile carburetor or whatever. Uh, Greg Vesna, again, uh, I call these guys friends of mine. I've known Greg. Greg talked me into running in the first election that I ever ran in 1993. Uh, political 
nothing newbie i didn't know anything uh greg i get the call from again a guy i'd lived with and spent a lot of time was mentored by in in the early 90s and i get the call and it's like ring ring yeah fez yeah jimmy yeah we need you to run in niagara south or niagara center it was called i'm like not on your fucking life. are you crazy sorry there's kids in the not on your life so now i got an internet radio show i can't say the bad words because i got kids in the audience so I was green as green could be. I said, I'll do it, but I won't do, like, I'm not doing anything. Said, That's okay. We'll put up the thousand bucks. He put the thousand bucks up. Um, you got to go get a hundred signatures. Uh, you can be a paper candidate. You don't have to do a damn thing. And I said, okay, I'll do it. Uh, I considered it a favor at the time. Didn't really realize it was, wow, it was a favor the other way around. I really received something from that. So Pete Marina is probably still at the old station, the giant that we call now, uh, see how on Forks Road at the time, talked me in. He said, uh, Jim, yeah, Green Canada, this is our last debate before the election. And somehow he got me to agree to go on this radio show. It was August 93, I think it was. Uh, Mulroney with a dissolving majority. That's enough, Fez. Um, <laughs> I get to the studio, August, silk shirt, long sleeve, um, soaked the chair with nerves. When I went for my voice, it actually, I didn't, coughing didn't even make it. I didn't know that when you were that nervous, your vocal cords stretched so tight that when you went to speak, there was nothing there. I shit the bed. And uh, it scared the life out of me. And then as the microphone came around, and I spent the night before at Vez's place, you know, talking into my uh, Sony Walkman at the time, or listened to it in the cassette tape over and over, proportional representation, you know. Oh, my God. So, anyways, Greg, thank you very much. Uh, he was my political influencer in 93, and I've run probably 10 elections since then under the Green Banner. He is also... The leader of the none of the above party. You ever know, you ever feel like you want to vote for none of these guys? Well, now there's a party that says, fuck all these guys. So Greg Vesna, leader of the none of the above party. Also, oh, we got the hippies behind the set here. They're probably smoking weed or something. Um, and author of Democracy A, Voter Guide, uh, Voter Guide to Action. So Jason Lupish is in the house with Erica Sherwood. They're do cutting their second film right now. My scene as of... The Sidewalk, an hour ago, is still in the flick. Uh, they're still writing it and shooting it and producing it, ever, like, on the fly right now. A wicked, wicked talent in town. Jason Lupish, Erica Sherwood, thank you for being here. We'll talk about the movie Fight. And uh, now... Uh, Aaron Berger is all tuned up. I didn't have a band booked for the show, but it seems really fitting if you guys want to lead us in with a little ditty. Aaron Berger and the Blue Stars, we're waiting on John Alvers. He's in traffic. Uh, was kind enough to pick up the van from Wellington Court. Thank you again. This show is brought to you by no one except Wellington Court. They're feeding you tonight. There's food around. Wow, it looks great. I can't wait to dive in. So Berger and picked us up a bass amp so that our boys that are using that theater, Crisp, and oh, uh, Anthony Sweet wants the bass amp as well. John Alvers, these will be, this is Berger, Blake, and Gould the way they look right now. But when John Alvers gets here, they will be Aaron Berger and the Blue Stars, and they are just tight as hell. So guys, if you guys want to take it away and play a song, that would be awesome. Aaron Berger, Berger, Blake, and Gould live on the Jim Fannin Show. Thanks very much, Jim. This is the first for us. We were the rock and roll caterers today. And Amen. Roll here in the Wellington Court catering van. I'm just going to sit over here. I'll be the, your, uh, your, you know, uh, your sidekick. Sounds good. Head it. Head heavy. Oh, wrong band. Sorry. So we've been doing some recording recently with Joe Lipinski downtown in St. Catharines. And uh, the next song we're going to play for you is called So Divine. And it's one of our new tracks that we've been working on in the studio.
much. Yeah, we have so much love for Jim Fan, and Jim is one of the biggest supporters of the Niagara music community here. He's somebody who shows up to shows, promotes all of the bands here, spends his money on buying CDs, and uh, we're very grateful and honored to help him on his launch here, and may this be the first of many Jim Fannin shows here at Sessions on the River, Jim. <laughs> Thanks, Berger. Well done, man. You guys are sounding tight. I was wondering how long you were going to keep MJ in that booth already. It looks good with the earphones on. and Matthew, James, Blake. Hey, you can keep talking. We can't hear a damn thing. Say whatever you want, MJ. finally found a way to shut him up. <laughs> Trey Show may be in the house later on. So, guys, uh, thank you very much. So, um, really, are you going to let him out of there? Because that door needs to slide open if you are. <laughs> I'm Jim Fan, and we're live from Sessions on the River. Thanks again to Chris Curry. He's the owner-operator here for mixing everything up. Thanks for the guests that have been on already and the guests that are to come. We're going. Our last band's at midnight, so uh, this is, uh, I've said this many times, just in case you're tuning in for the first time. This is all about the music and the love of the music and the love between these guys. And um, these guys' music has been hugely important in my life and just delved into and it's almost like a love affair I have with a lot of these albums just like anyone else has done but uh, so I got a lot of time for these guys the idea was to feature them and get them because I'm tired of all their old music get them back in studio and let's hear some new stuff so that's what we're doing today it's all about the issues and it's all about the music and the love speaking of love Gord Miller is my next guest he's a former environmental commissioner come on up Gord right over here Hey. Watch the chords. No Gord Miller again. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, this is immense uh, gratitude. Uh, you know, I'm fortunate enough. I'm sure not everyone has your cell phone number. And I'll tell the little story about how this came to be. I've been off the air for a couple of years and frustrated. You know, I'm a caller. I'm on a local radio station here and there. But you know, I used to have free wheel to do whatever I want, talk to anyone I want about whatever issue I want, and pretty much say whatever I want. It's a little bit more that way this this time because I don't I'm working for a proper station. But um, when I first, it's all about the music, right? So when I got, I was kind of manic one day, and like I've really been mitching to do something. It's been a year to the day on the nineteenth of the last federal election, which takes a lot out of me. People think I'm untouchable because I act that way, right? But I'm really a sensitive guy. And, and I found that running in these elections really leaves me scarred afterwards, you know? Um, so I was itching to get back on. I guess I'm healed enough that I think I can do it. Um, although there's a Niagara West Glambrook of riding coming up, but actually we got a candidate for that. Um, so it was about the music, but then my first call is to a guy like you because I'm so deeply... Uh, concerned with some of our environmental issues. I know you've got some great knowledge and experience. So the call goes like this. Gore, he takes my call, first of all. Uh, <laughs> and I catch him on the lay, or on the river in your boat. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Jimmy, yeah. Well, uh, I just know him. I'm, I said, what are you doing for fun? Well, right now, I'm out on my boat on the river. And uh, like I, I'm not doing that anymore because I'm talking to you. So <laughs> anyways, we talked 15 minutes or whatever. And I said, hey, here's what I'm doing. And I want you to come down. And he says, you know what? I'm, 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 dri I'm driving in. I'm going back to the house now. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll call you back when I get to my computer. And I get a voicemail message from him. He goes, well, I don't know if you said kid, but that's how I felt. You're like, you know, buddy, I don't know. I, gotta, I must have a small a soft spot for you because I'm free. And yeah, I'll do it. I'll come down. So I really am grateful because I, I wouldn't it's have done it. 400 kilometers. No, 500. I wouldn't God. have done it if you hadn't have said yes. I, you know, I, I wanted that that premier guest, and we've got three or four of them today. So, Gord Miller, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, former Environmental Commissioner of Ontario, Green Party candidate for the Feds under yep. Elizabeth May, which I actually, oh my God, did I do that again? Yeah, I did it with you. Well, you know, we thought maybe Guelph is a real. Mike Schreiner can talk a lot about Guelph. He's really laid some. Uh, you know, put the seeds down there. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, optimistically thought that maybe you had a chance to get elected there. It didn't happen. Tell me a little bit about that experience. Did you, where you left? I mean, you had a pretty good job before you ran. So you, you're getting some time off. Did you feel a little beat up afterwards? Like, does it well, take a little bit I'm, out of you it? You know, being environment commissioner of Ontario is, 
is a pretty high profile, you know, in the media, in your face job all the time, 24 hour job, really, you mm -hmm. know, so uh, moving to politics wasn't that hard, you know, I mean, and the intensity, in fact, I probably a little less uh, in terms of the intensity of your, your life. But uh, of course, politics is a lot of door knocking and running around and uh, physical stuff that uh, uh, was actually quite healthy for you. So no, I, I, I'm... Uh, I had a pretty good, easy time of it. I mean, no we very, very work. hard. Wish, wish the results were better than they were. We spent an awful lot of money. We spent more money on that campaign than any any politician in the history of Canada. Did you know that? The number one expenditure for an election campaign in the last election, which is the richest thing, number one in Canada. You know, you have 338 ridings, four or five people running in every riding. The number one was my expenditure. Can we fact check that quick? Uh, <laughs> and it's know, fact check. It was on civil the, servant. You know it was I mean? in the National Post, my God. Wow. <laughs> So cool. Gord Miller is my guest, uh, former environmental commissioner of Ontario, and just talking about his latest campaign as Green Party candidate. Uh, are you, do you stay connected to the party? Are you still involved oh, yeah. in any? Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's yeah. been a lot of talk, and, you know, is Elizabeth, you know, she maybe because she, you know, does she want this? Is, you know, I, I thought, I, you know, when we first recruit, hey, I was at the party when mm -hmm. we were recruiting Elizabeth. You remember those days. I ran for leadership sure. with her, against her. Again, not to win. I got 29 votes, but, you know, her and David Cherenchenko were pretty tight. And right. there was a faction of the party, and I was pretty involved then. I was watching council and whatnot. There was a faction of the party that said, oh, we can't have this love affair. We, it would be nice to have the third party mm -hmm. guy in there to inject some of the issues, like horse trading. Like, well, we'll pull our candidate here for you, the NDP, if you do, do us a favor. You know, and that was a very contentious issue. Um, so you stay connected to the party. And at that time, like, what's a better leader for the party than a star like Elizabeth May? She's good on her feet. She's witty. She's got deep, deep knowledge and experience. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we want that kind of star power, you know, and, uh, and she's been great. She got herself elected. And, you know, that was the decision the council chose, put all the resources in one riding and get mm -hmm. her elected it worked mm -hmm. thank god because if it hadn't it would have been correct didn't work party. for me yeah <laughs> and that and you got the that kind of treatment as well yeah. so uh you know and i'm in the background going dude there's our next freaking leader right there you know and you know we talked about this off the air and it's you know you don't speak french or whatever but do you see a leadership role within the party whether it's leader or no. deputy or no, advisor I'm still, I'm still, or uh, shadow I'm, or well i'm still on the shadow cabinet okay and on the federal writing and i'm i'm a senior policy advisor to uh, to mike schreiner the uh, Ontario oh party. Uh, yeah so, so there's I'm, some recruiting no, going I'm still, on I'm still, i see you guys i'm still you around guys are stealing staff members too from the gpc here and we're, there. we're 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 lurking in the back room. I'm I'm a back room boy now, you know. Oh, I, wow. See? Okay. Well. See, so that's uh, so I'm not. I haven't, you know, parted from the party. I just uh, stepped back from the light. You know, cool. I'm. Well, nobody really. The light. Nobody really cares about the Green Party. So let's get into the issues. Tell us about. I care about the Green Party. Oh, okay. And you do too. <laughs> nobody that's listening to this show goes. <laughs> <laughs> Says the none of the above party from the Peating Gallery. Um, let's talk wetlands. Yeah, is sure. that something that's a real oh, it is. hot issue for you? It is. And, and so here's, we're, I, we haven't even gone down the trail yet, right? Because city council, mm -hmm. it came to council. They got bombarded. They had too many people show up, and somebody in their wisdom said, "We can't deal with this. We need a bigger venue. We need more consultation." So we're just at the beginning now the groups are formed i don't well, know people, how active people should know you know people get I, I was just testifying at an ontario municipal board hearing on a provincially significant wetland a couple of weeks ago that that hearing hasn't finished yet uh but you know that it's something very near and dear to my heart you know in in ontario wetlands i think people know intuitively how important wetlands are uh ecology on the landscape and we used to we've lost 80 percent of our wetlands in southern ontario that were originally there right mm. so what we did some years ago and people have to understand this thing is called a provincially significant wetland what does that mean well it means when we, we had a look at wetlands, it said some wetlands in, you know, are really, really important. Other wetlands, meh, not so much, and we, we can give up some. So we, we developed this 20 years ago. Now we developed a classification system, a you know, base, scientific based classification system. We said we're going to look at the wetlands that are left in, in Ontario, southern Ontario especially, and we're going to say we'll classify them you know, by a, a, a system. And you have to be a qualified person, a trained person to, to classify them. I used to be that kind of person, uh, but I'm out of date now. But... And then we're going to find some, so some would be locally significant, they're pretty, you know, general, could be changed, replaced, or moved perhaps. Uh, there could be things that are regionally significant, but we're going to identify those ones that are provincially significant. Those are very, very special. There are not very many left, and there's not many in the province. A tiny area of the province where we say those have scored so high, 
because of endangered species, because of their location, uniqueness, because of not just uh, ecological, but also cultural values and the importance. And if, they're, if they score that high, they're provincially significant. And then we're going to change the provincial policy statement, which is a part of the Planning Act, part of the legislation in a, in a way. It says, and it says there should be no development in provincially significant wetlands. And, and, the, and the law says we must be consistent with the provincial policy statement. We must be consistent with that. There should be no development in provincially significant wetlands. It's, it's, just, it's a tiny restriction we put on things, but we recognize this area down here. Now you've got, you guys have got one. You've got a provincially significant wetland, and the law is clear, and I don't know where anybody gets off saying that they can, you can develop or move or change a provincially significant wetland. You can't. That's the by very definition. They're part of the tiny percentage in a landscape that ecologically has to be left alone and has to be allowed to function. Thank you for that. Now, uh, you know, you, I, it was something struck a chord with me. You said, we know. Like, we these know. are important to our ecosystem, to our agricultural existence, to our, uh, to our culture in some cases. Um, and I think we've been taught that because I think back in the day, you're like, oh, fuck it, just fill it in. Fill it in, yeah. Uh, you know, um, well, that's how even we lost on your own land. And we didn't need permits. And we were, you know, just, oh, yeah, that's the useless part of the land back there. So I think we've grown a little bit more sensitive to that kind of thing. Now, maybe the natives were more sensitive to well, that kind were. of thing. Of course maybe were, yeah. even the early settlers were, were I'm probably not, but the, the wisdom and the elders of, of the natives, uh, this kind of stuff is spiritually and culturally significant to them as well. So who fucking cares really if we, if we pave one more over, yeah, right. you know, like what difference is it going to make to Niagara Falls? Like they're going to say, well, no, this development goes as is. And you get this massive, massive infrastructure spending private money mm -hmm. or it, you know, if we can't do it, if we know I can't have it our, our, our way, we won't have it. So, Really, who cares? Like, well, why are we hanging on to these little pieces of useless, you know, maybe you could speak to the significance of them. Well, sure. I mean, that's, you know, the, there's, there's living things on the landscape of the land, right? And it's a, think of the land as like a fabric, and there's some spots in the fabric that are really, really critical. You know, you, you can't have it, picture, well, you can see it, you can see, go down, down Toronto, and, and, you know, how far do you have to go to see really living wildlife and, and living ecosystems that are, that are functioning properly, right? It's just an urban landscape that goes on and on and on and on. So there, there have to be spots on the fabric of the landscape where life can continue, the ecosystem can function. And, and, and these wetlands are critical parts of that. And they, there's a whole bunch of roles they play in terms of, but I think most significantly, the most big general concept is, is there have to be spots on the landscape to make it all work. To, make, oh, okay. to, to allow the, the birds to migrate and, and to, to allow the species, mm. the, the, uh, you know, the little creatures, little amphibians and frog, the frogs and the, the various kinds of creatures, somewhere they can go to breed, right? So, so we would they can live in a greater landscape, but there are special areas that they have to be, we have to save. They have to have some spots to go. And we're not immediately aware of the impact of that loss and the chain the domino effect no. that it might have down the way. Now, talk to me a little bit about in the importance of, of saving something that's unique and one of the last things. Why is, well, why is that important that it's well, the it's, last Carolinian forest? I mean, who cares? We're fucking yeah, exactly. paving them down anyways. <laughs> well, you know, look at uh, down in the south. They do it everywhere. Uh, you know uh, what I mean? Uh, you know, all, there's a famous author, a, a naturalist. Uh, well, he started off as, as a, a exploiter of wildlife, and he, and he developed a whole philosophy about nature and changed his thinking during his life called Aldo Leopold. And he had a great line. You know, we, we used to... Uh, when I was young, I used to, and my dad used to do it too, you know, if something broke, you know, you, you took it apart and tried to fix it. You're, they call it tinkering, right? You know, you take it all apart. Well, I can fix that. You know, I remember my, my poor mother had a toaster disassembled for about three years, right? <laughs> Until she finally went out and bit the bullet and bought a new one, right? Nowadays, we don't tinker so much because you can't, we don't know no, how these things work. But, 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 the, but Louis Leopold said, he said, you know, the, 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 the first rule of intelligent tinkering is to keep all the parts, okay? And that's when you were playing ecological games, when we're tearing apart ecosystems, you gotta keep all the parts. We might know why something's, we not, not, sorry, we might not know why something's important till after we destroy it and it's gone. Mm, and then I say, oh, we shouldn't have done that, right? And that's, so you can't, you can't answer in the negative. You can't say, well, well, why should we keep that? Well, because it's part of nature, it's, it has some importance, some function, and if we lose it entirely, 
we'll find out the consequences then. Mm -hmm. Gordon Miller is my guest. He's the former Ontario. Uh, Ontario's Environment Commissioner. I we used to call him the Eco Commish, Eco guy. Now on uh, Twitter, it's G U I or something. Yeah, Eco, G like like in Gaia. Gaia. See, G A I E C O G A I. Uh, he's my guest. Up next, we're going to have Mike Schreiner, um, and then Greg Vesna will form part of our uh, our green panel. But just on the way out, we're going to take a short break and then come back with a little bit more Aaron Berger and the Blue Stars now that John Alvers is here. So thanks for tuning in. I'm Jim Fannin. This is Gord Miller. We're live from Sessions on the River. Gord, um, tell us a little bit about the path that we're headed down with the people that are opposing this development. Well, not the development. They just don't want them to pave over this part of it. Just put uh, it somewhere else, right? I mean, there are, there's other well, places that can, can do go. you can do the development without taking that piece of land and build right up next to whatever it is, the guidelines. So tell us the path. What do we have to expect politically? Like, first we go... To, well, and to city council, what if they ratify it then? Well, well, if they go, okay, we're good. We would that. wish that the council would do the respect the provincial guidelines. That's right, Hell right. no, this is Niagara <laughs> Falls for crying okay, out loud. Well, let's assume we, uh, we, they, we that, already made the deal with the devil. I'm sure the money's changed if hands. If it goes the, bad, the deposit and the, has been taken, and the council <laughs> makes a decision to do to go ahead with this. Then, then unfortunately, it's because it costs time and money for people. But there's got to be people who are opposed to put together an appeal to the Ontario Municipal Board. That's the mechanism we had. Okay. And then there's a hearing at the Ontario Municipal Board, and people come and give uh, evidence on both sides. And, and, this and they're board. completely on the take. The OMB's no, been no, bought no. by private no, interest no. groups. Just, no. Really? Really. really. Okay, so they're going to get a fair there's share of the OMB. They'll get a fair share. How many decisions have you been concerned about that the OMB's made that you wish didn't go the way they went? Oh, well, there's quite a few of those. Okay, but, there's, so. but there's been some big, some big wins, too, Some where there was millions of dollars involved and uh, and their OMB you know went for the environmental side and uh, and stopped it so not helps. knowing anything about this what is it a coin flip for whether or not well, this depends. place gets protected? I'd say that, I'd say you know because I spoke to wrong the, the law well, of course I've just been before the OMB and there's no decision on that one yet so I don't know how that works but right. but the argument is you know the planning act says you must follow the provincial policy statement the provincial policy statement says no development in provincially significant wetland, wetlands so uh, you know, it's pretty clear. That's a pretty strong argument. And uh, I, I know, I think you have, you have to go and you have to go make the argument, unfortunately, and that costs time and money. Gord Miller is my guest. Chris, we're going to take a break right now and we'll come back with Mike Schreiner. We're going to talk to the leader of the Green Party of Ontario. If you could take us out a little bit of music there. Chris Curry, are you in the booth? Oh, there he is. And then uh, John is in the house, so we'll get a little sound check from him and we'll come back with Aaron Berger and the Blue Stars morphed over from Burger Blake and Gould. And on cue, here they come. I'm the Jim Fannin Show. We'll be right back. Short break. I am Jim Fan. We're live from Sessions on the River. Thanks to everyone that showed up. We got more politics. Mike Schreiner's coming up next. And then we got Greg Besner. We're talking local green issues. This is Aaron Berger and the Blue Stars. And this song is called I Will Stand With You. Take it away, boys. i 
I will stand with you. Thank you very much, boys. Awesome. Do this is the Jim Fannin Show. We're live from Sessions on the River. I'm not going to thank Chris Curry one more time. You guys can unplug. Click, click. Thanks to Wellington Court Restaurant. I just finally got the first bite of something, guys. Oh my God! Did you taste that prosciutto pizza with whatever's on there? Oh my good lord! It's it's nasty. So, lots of free food. Get down here to Sessions on the River. Um, bands on the hour, all day. We can our last acts at midnight. And if we still have any gas left in the tank at midnight and there's still anyone hanging around, we're going to do a jam and just let the cameras run. And uh, so, my thanks to many of the special guests. My next guest coming up is leader of the Green Party of Ontario, Mike Schreiner, um, a guy I've known for quite a long time who's made a difference without being elected, uh, influencing policy by being the leader of a party that doesn't hold a seat in, in the House right now. So Mike Schreiner, come on up. Thanks for the time. I really appreciate it. Let's see it. <laughs> Think of my not standing while I shake your hand. Oh, I don't right want to rip something down over here. Matthew. Hey, it's great to be on today. Awesome. Yeah, I'm Before really Before we start, can I give this you. place a plug? I mean, yeah. this is amazing. Local beer, local wine, local food, local music. It can't get any better than yeah. this. Well, I'm, I really appreciate you saying that. I, the first time I walked in here, said to Chris, you got a room for rent? I'm like, I don't want to leave. And if it gets ugly tonight, I might just be sleeping on the couch. Who knows? <laughs> so we may have a big sleepover here. Uh, Mike Schreiner, leader of the Green Party of Ontario. Thanks again for taking the time. I really pleasure. appreciate it. Um, well, we got so many things we can talk about, but um, my pet peeve right now is how we elect our politicians. And I know you sing from the same Tom book as I do. What's your experience of what's going on now with political reform? Maybe you can speak to it in the province. And I know you got an eye on the federal mm -hmm. as well. So is this a fucking shell game again? Are we just going to play the part? I mean, McGinty, we did vote on this once in Ontario. It wasn't, in my opinion, a very honest campaign, and Fez could speak to that when he comes Absolutely. up. You know, less information in something like this is just, a, you know, status quo. Um, so speak to us about if you think it's on the horizon and what we can do to help move it along, if so. Well, I think we have a great opportunity, but I tell you what, when the uh, Prime Minister Trudeau backed off on electoral reform a couple days ago, the outrage across the country. I mean, he reversed himself in 24 hours. It was, I haven't seen a politician backtrack so quickly as he did on that one. And it is clear to me that a number of people voted liberal in this election because of the promise in the first past the post voting system. If Trudeau backtracks on that and betrays those voters, he's going to pay the price oh, in the mean next like election. Like the voters that he betrayed uh, with the, <laughs> with the legal, LNG project? The L oh. <laughs> How about the legalizing of marijuana? Well, there's that well, one too. As he's still dragging his Blair's feet on shakedown it. in Toronto, they're taking these dispensaries down and targeting the high-profile ones that Jody and Mark Emery own. Exactly. And this is bullshit, man. They're going in, and you know what they're being charged with? 
simple possession in zoning infractions. They're yeah. not even charging when distribution, which is what they're there for, really. I mean, that's so you, you can't speak out of both, you know. And he came to St. Catharines. He was in, in South Niagara yesterday. He's mobbed everywhere. Mm -hmm. He's a freaking rock star. I don't think he's the smartest guy around. He. He has learned to stick to the script. He's obviously got good po political people around him. You don't get elected when you're not smart without that. But if he ever gets off script, he, I mean, he can barely, I'm, I'm going to trash Justin Trudeau, <laughs> but he doesn't carry a conversation well, forget policy. So, I mean, we don't have recall mechanism like the, none of the above yeah. party advocates for. Yeah, we advocate for it too. And the Greens and the too, Greens, absolutely. Exactly, yeah. Um, and so we elect these guys time after time after time, and then we don't get kissed before we get bent, and then we complain our ass hurts. What are we doing here, man? It's the same old thing over and over. Well, I think it's clear our democracy's broken, and, our, and it starts with our electoral system being broken. The answer to that is proportional representation. And if the Trudeau liberals backtrack on that, they're going to pay a price politically. The other thing we have to do, which we're seeing both federally and provincially, is getting big money out of politics, which is an Great issue point. I've been leading the charge on here in Ontario. Uh, we absolutely need to ban corporate and union donations to political parties. We need to substantially lower the donation limits and the spending limits for political parties. And we need to bring in a public financing system that's available to every registered political party in the province. You mean like we had federally? Similar to what we had federally, though federally... It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, they don't anymore. Harper took it away. Right. And the thing is, if you want big money out of politics, um, it's much less expensive to have the public help fund political parties, not exclusively fund them. I think political parties should still go out and fundraise through grassroots donations. Um, but we already have a public funding system in Ontario. It's a pay to play system. If you have mm. deep pockets and you donate to a political party, the taxpayer gives you a tax refund which benefits those wealthy donors that the liberals, for example, have been selling cash for access events to. We want to get rid of that system, move to a vote-to-play system, and make sure it's available to all parties. Mike Schreiner is my guest. He's the leader of the Green Party of Ontario. How long now, Mike? Uh, since 2009. It's 2009. Yeah, November 2009. Okay, so tell me, give me, give me your thoughts on this. Oh, jeez. <laughs> 2006. Yes. August. AGM, Ottawa. Green Party of Canada, leadership race. That was the last one. That's 10 years ago, dude. That's right. Now, I know you don't have any responsibility there. I don't. But we used to, we, I think the Constitution was changed by the Board of Directors or whatever, however they changed the Constitution over there when they feel like changing it. But now we've got a system similar to the Green Party of Ontario. It's so frustrating for me. And Frank DeYoung was there a long time. He was. And people really supported them, 75% yes. of the time or more at the AGM. Mm -hmm. Leadership races build parties. Yes. You know, Frank maybe wasn't, he, you know, he was maybe walked out the door a little bit. His time was, you were up and coming, you had some organization behind you. You knew the rules, get yourself elected. It was healthy for the party. Now, we haven't done it at the GPC level in 10 years. We haven't done it since. So talk to me about this lack of new membership, of new... Con I don't even care if it's just a debate about the issues. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it doesn't have to be a formal leadership race, but this is what builds parties. Mm -hmm. This is where you get the infusion of new members. Vote for me. Vote. Well, 29 people voted for me in the last <laughs> leadership race, but an important function of a so-called democratic grassroots party, which we don't always act as... Uh, here you are the benefit of it as the leader. Hey, you just go show up to the AGM. What's, what's the threshold? 75? 75, yes. Approval rating. So that's, that's right. you're flying fat past that, and so is Elizabeth oh, yeah. May. So we won't have another election for leader until you're good and damn ready that we will, <laughs> right? So <laughs> well, my how is that the yeah. grassroots or dem de democratic? Well, my hope is, is that any time, and I've made this very clear, any time that the members of the Green Party of Ontario are ready to get rid of me, I will walk away, like no doubt about it. Um, and I'm not going to stay here forever. Like I've already said to folks, um, and a few people don't like it when I say this, but I intend to get elected in 2018, 20% uh, in the last election. I think that laid the foundation to be elected uh, in 2018. 
But if I don't get elected, I'm going to step down, and my time will be done, and wow. we'll be ready That's for so cool uh, another leader that. to and step I forward. I don't get my designs on your job. I mean, no, I've, you I've, should start laying the. Well, I, well, I'm going to get elected in 2018, so don't yeah. lay the groundwork too soon. No, no, but, but I really uh, I'm trying to mentor other there. leaders in the party. Awesome, uh, and through our shadow cabinet, through our cool. deputy leaders, to ensure that we have a large number of candidates ready to step forward uh, when the day comes for me to move on to something else. Cool. Well, I really, really appreciate your frankness, and sorry if you thought you were ambushing there. I didn't, I, hey, I no, haven't okay. I'm already a, on the record. I'm already have, on the record for 2018. I haven't scripted a damn thing today, so... Uh, <laughs> Some no. people don't like it when I say that, though. They're like, Mike, Mike, don't say that. And it's well, like, no, i got to be honest I with you. I can people. see how the grassroots wants to hear that you're in it for the long haul, and that uh, speaks to uh, just the frankness and honesty of the conversation, so I really appreciate that. Mike Schreiner is my guest. He's the leader of the Green Party of Ontario. We're talking local green issues. Uh, federal and provincial. Um, what else is on your radar? And, and I want to give you props, number one, because there's no one elected from the Green Party of Ontario in Ontario. And you've got some, you get your talents in at Queen's Park. Absolutely. I mean, I, you, know, you know what it's in been? Years, you're, you're, you're helping formulate policy. You're working with par- people from different parties, sponsoring bills. Like, man, this is so cool to see you having influence from the outside. We expect Elizabeth May to have influence. She's in there. Mm-hmm. She's, you know, she's part of the cog. You're not. So how are you getting it done? Yeah, so this is all about grassroots organizing. And I think what we've proven is that if you have your facts straight and you go out and you engage the public and you get people to sign petitions and write letters and put pressure on the government, and you need a government, and you know, as critical as I am of the liberal government here in Ontario, the one thing they do do, they listen. And so when we've put pressure on them for things like um, you know, fundraising reform legislation or putting a price on carbon pollution or saving the experimental lakes area. And we've gone with a compelling argument and a number of signatures on a petition they've acted. The, the, thing, that work, the thing we're working on right now is protecting our water. So we have a whole stop giving our water the campaign and, a, and they're wow. taking a step in the right direction on that one as well. And so when I met with the Minister of the Environment on it, um, I said, you know, I'm going to keep throwing postcards at you. I'm going to keep throwing letters at you until you guys fix the broken water-taking rules. And I've been told that those types of grassroots efforts that the Green Party is engaged in is making a difference and will continue to make a difference. And obviously, if we had a seat in the legislature, we'd be able to make an even bigger difference. Um, But we're not going to let that hold us back. Because some of the challenges the province is facing right now, they can't wait till 2018. We need some solutions right now. Mike Schreiner is my guest. He's a longtime serving leader of the Green Party of Ontario since 2009. I'm Jim Fan, and we're broadcasting live from Sessions in the River. Get your ass down here. We got a liquor license. We got more live bands coming up at six o'clock. We're going to take a short break in a minute, but just a little bit more with Mike Schreiner, and then we're going to bring up Greg Vesna. He's a whole character unto himself, too. I can't wait to get Greg up here. And then we'll bring you all up together. We'll try and make it sound like the view for boys, for political men. The (laughs) view. Like that, yeah, yeah. No, we're not going to do that. And if uh, there's a bounty out for the first one that drops, I know, right? On the show after this, that costs you 50 bucks. Yeah. Mike Schreiner is my guest. I am Jim Fannin, live from Sessions on the River. Mike, uh, I acknowledge you. I really think it's so cool that you're, you're having that political influence at Queen's Park. Uh, we talked about the provincially, the PSWs, the wetlands here. I talked to Gord Miller, who's got such great deep knowledge, isn't he? Just, oh, he's fantastic. He's, <laughs> like, he's a great you? policy. He's a policy advisor for the Green Party of Ontario now. Yeah. And it's just, we're so fortunate to have somebody with his depth of knowledge. uh, And you talk about grassroots, like I'm kind of sitting on the fence on, well, a lot of times I look at my grassroots activity and go, Mm -hmm. like I run elections. It's, you know, what I do, I can contribute once in a while. I'm so glad to hear you've got somebody in Niagara West Glanbrook and we talk about that in a minute. Yes. Uh, Rick Dykstra rumored to be moving over the old uh, sitting federal MP for St. Catharines, moving over to a riding he doesn't live in, uh, was born in. Uh, will probably win that seat. And my opinion of Rick Dykstra is, one, he's surrounded himself with brilliant minds. Uh, I'm not saying that he doesn't have one. Rick is a, a, an intelligent guy. Um, he played the political game pretty well there in the federal conservatives. You know, he, mm-hmm. I think he was well coached. I think he's very reasonable. Yeah, he had a slip, slip up in the last election. It was something that cost him some bad pub. But that's not why he lost the election, because of the Mansion House fiasco. It's, you know, it was, the red tide was coming. Absolutely. And I think he's got designs on Premier. And I think he's got the political smarts and the backers to get there. And 
you know, if we had a, a conservative premier in Ontario, it wouldn't be the first time. And so this is the first step for him, I think. And I'm like, you know, similar to when I didn't like the candidates that were running for mayor, I'm like, I can't let this happen, man. I, I, I just have to be part of the conversation. So I'm so glad you shut me down on that today because <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, I've been praying for the health of our politicians. Please, no, no by-election, no by-election, please. Many times I find myself victim of, like, J you're the only guy, dude. Mm -hmm. Or you're, you know, I don't want to run a paper candidate. Right. So, and that's why I kind of come out of the retirement. And um, so that's what I think is going on over there. What have you got planned for that election? And, yep. and how can we make a difference at that grassroots level? Which is the most amazing experience that anyone can do is vote for themselves, to put themselves on a ballot and go take the bullet and, and do what you think is right, whether it's the, none of the above party or the green party. So, yeah, so we're, we're excited. Donna Cridland, who is our shadow cabinet critic for food and agriculture or rural affairs uh, from Welland, uh, ran in Welland last time forced me running in this by-election. And one of the reasons I'm excited about having Donna run in this by-election is that she's a very strong advocate for protecting farmland, local food sources, and water. And so one of the challenges I've made to the other political leaders in Ontario is why don't you take the food and water first pledge? It's simple. Protect prime farmland in this province from development and protect source water regions. If we can't eat and we can't drink, where are we? I'm to, to date, I'm the only political leader in Ontario to sign the food and water first pledge. Maybe Vesna has. I'll have to check on that. But at least out of those other three with seats at Queen's Park, none of them have said, I will sign the pledge to protect prime farmland and source water regions wow. in this province. Seems like and a I think no it's total no-brainer. And I think it's particularly appalling for conservatives who represent rural ridings, did not protect farmland. We're losing 350 acres of farmland a day in this province. That's the equivalent of the size of the city of Toronto on an annual basis. Mm. And it's not just an environmental argument. It's not just a food security argument. It's an economic argument. Well, that's the food what and farming sector, 740,000 jobs in this province over a $40 billion contribution to our GDP, and we are destroying the asset base of that essential part of our provincial economy. I don't understand why they won't sign the Food and Water First Pledge. So that's a really good point, and I think that's um, one that maybe we have not been good at communicating. And I say we as the Green Party, and we're not perfect, you know, we're not the most well-funded organization. Uh, we've got a lot of volunteers. And, you know, I talked to the girls at the office and, and yeah, they're working hard over there. You know what I mean? So um, it, it's, it falls on guys like us maybe <laughs> to get it right sometimes. But I mean, uh, um, anyways, I'm rambling now. Yeah, well, Don will do a great job. And yeah. I think what we lack in financial resources, we make up for in passion and in volunteer um, mobilization and grassroots engagement. And, and I know Don is passionate about protecting farmland and water resources, and we're planning on making it a big issue in the by-election. Mike Schreiner is my guest. We're going to take a short break. We're going to bring up Greg Vesna, who is founder and chairman of Hydrofuel Inc. He is the founder and leader of the None of the Above Party and an author of a book called Democracy, A Voter Guide to Action. Mike, thanks very much. We'll bring thanks you up on a, as part my of pleasure. the panel. Um, we're going to take a short break and we're going to recue these uh, Aaron Berger and the Blue Stars to bring us back with another song. And then six o'clock when we're done this show, we, oh, geez, I got some time to fill. Lupish and Sherwood are coming up. We're going to talk about the fight movie, the fight film. But next, Greg Vesna, who will be back right after this break. Thank you, Niagara. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> So Leah and I were talking earlier about uh, the healing power of music and it's definitely something that I've been able to bear witness to and experience so I'm uh, going to dedicate this song to you Leah and to, to Josh Mills, a good friend and someone who's a really big hearted person and uh, yeah it's hard to, it's really hard to be alive so uh, it's, music is a huge blessing and it's a way that uh, we're able to as artists to process some of the difficult emotions that we carry. So this song was written by a good friend of ours, Carl David Onofrio, CD. 
and uh, it's about the city of Niagara Falls, and I think it's uh, a good example of beauty making um, as an antidote to depression. Matthew James Blake and Nathaniel Gould and I'm going to invite Nathaniel up to lead us for a song here. you 
come here in the rain And you won't come here in the night I keep asking you to stay to Stay here all the time Won't you stay here for a while done guys come on take a seat over here we'll talk to you before we bring up Fez I'm Jim Fannin we're live from Sessions on the River in Fort Erie get your ass down here we got cold beer local beer local wine free food from Wellington Court thank you very much Dale and Eric Peacock for sponsoring the food today they set out stuff is that good food or what wow thank you Wellington Court Lupish is in the house Sherwood thank you for your patience we're going to talk a little bit bullshit uh, politics after this but uh Burger Blanket Gould, I just had a conversation with John out there. I'm glad he's healthy and okay. I know what it's like when you're ha an hour and a half late for a gig and you're stuck, the gardener's closed. We're always an hour and a half late for a gig. Oh, well, see, <laughs> not everyone knows that, man. But uh, so really cool, you guys. I know you're headed to a retreat. I know you're right in the middle of mixing post-production. Well, you're kind of like lupish, I think. You're still writing, producing, and recording. Some's in the can, some's not. Um, so I really appreciate your time today. You bucked up, uh, picked up the van, which ha helped you guys out a little bit and delivered the food to us. So Nathaniel Gould, thank you very much. Black Flies, man, so many projects. Aaron Berger, again, Matthew James Blake. Uh, wow. Um, so Keegan was here. He was busting my balls earlier about um, how Aaron Berger is my boy. When's your boyfriend? When you want to talk about, <laughs> is that all you want to talk about is Aaron Berger? And I'm like, what? Come on. But Berger would say I'm all about botting, you know, because I crush on botting. He's a witch on guitar. He writes And really I don't know good why, why you're into that guy anyway. book for either. Wanderers, man. The guy's a fucking witch. I love that kid. He's got swagger, blah, blah, blah. So I got to, hey, set up the show one more time here. I think Gord Miller, he was one of the first people I called. Mike Schreiner is here. Greg Vesna's coming up next for him, part of a green panel i wouldn't have done it if i hadn't got the support and you guys are part of that you guys are one of my first calls i know i kind of steamrolled with the date and you got culture jam going on in niagara falls all weekend man united church on lundy's lane go check it out they're banging there right now right culture jam we're making history in niagara falls yeah perpetual the peace longest project, lowest dude. budget art <laughs> festival you've ever been to yeah we could tie hey guarantee niagara falls gave some money out yeah. this year for the arts that's true this you is know? a good it's a it's a start. There's a lot more that needs to be done, but it is something. So the ball's moving in the right direction. St. Catharines has been fortunate enough to have huge infrastructure spending, whether you yeah. think of uh, the Meridian Center or something like that, where the Ice Dogs play, sure. and we, we can bring some concerts in, or the, the First Center. Ontario Performing Arts Center. And there's been a number of different rooms there. We have Mark LaLama on today talking about how deeply important that infrastructure spending's been for the downtown core. 
the recipients are businesses like Mate Cafe, where Justin Trudeau shows up with 600 people yesterday, and uh, I'm not a Trudeau fan, as we've been discussing, but so cool to see the local, there's not, I mean, I was still in real estate, but 10 years ago, I was downtown, and it was 50% vacancy rate in the commercial stuff. Closed, for sale, uh, going out of business, mm -hmm. couldn't give the stuff away. Now, try and find a vacant piece on St. Paul Street. Niagara Falls isn't there yet. They've made some good steps. Uh, you guys have been the recipient to so that, that kind of stuff. So talk to us a little bit about how important that funding has been to you to do uh, these events. So the Culture Jam is a big commitment. Tell us a little bit about that and how important the funding has been. Sure. So what's happening now, it's a week long. It's called a Culture Jam, and there's been a mix of music happening. There's artists that are there doing visual art. There's a, a dance event, a couple, a couple different dance events. One of them is uh, an ecstatic dance. So this is a combination of improvised music with dance and movement. And then Sarah Murphy Dyson, who I think is part of the show today. Yeah, and, she's doing her naked. So she's, later. she has a dance workshop on that Sunday, a movement workshop that's happening between 2 and 4 p.m. And our friend Deb from Boston Pizza and Welland, Deb Zahara, she's going to be coming in to do yoga with music at 10 a.m. on Sunday. So, uh, yeah, and the event was made possible by a grant. We got $2,500 to put something together. So it was a very modest amount of money. But uh, C.D. Onofro, who played earlier, he helped to captain and uh, put a lot of energy into making this event happen and then got support from other friends and group members. And, yeah, without the funding for the arts is essential. You know, we need spaces to be able to create, and it's a real – it's a struggle for – everyone in different ways um, to be able to have enough money to live and to try and make art. And uh, it's, it's not something that's unique to us as artists in that there's many people that aren't in the aren't, are not in the arts and are very much struggling to have enough money and resources to live. But uh, within the arts, if you don't have funding and support for what you're doing, it's a really tough go. So to see the way that the, investment in cultural infrastructure in St. Catharines has brought life to the city. I mean, there's all the, there's the talk of uh, the creative city and sometimes you know that it's when it's bullshit, you know that. The compassionate city. Yeah, well, the creative city is like another, like a bigger thing. Mm -hmm. Like the compassionate city is that Sensex thing. Right. But the creative city is like a model that's been used for, by oh, Richard okay. Florida and other people. All right. Um, but anyways, like you feel it, right? You feel that sense of vibrancy. And like you're saying, there are businesses that are doing well. And Mate has been a huge hub for a Struggle lot of Struggle for us many years well. on that corner before they've you know, been able to reap the rewards of that. Well, Chris was somebody who had a vision for what he was doing and saw, really saw a need. And he was looking five years in advance when he started renoing that space. And a lot of, yeah, a lot of us have met there and, that's a gathering space for all kinds of folks in the community, but right. that's a, it's me rocking the mic a little bit there. Yeah, no. And then we, yeah, Aaron Berger, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, Aaron Berger and the Blue Stars, yes, will perform as Burger Blake and Gold, which you just did as an acoustic. I love the setup, especially when MJ gets up there and blasts out heaven. Oh my God, if we get a little heaven before you go. Man, uh, such big fans of you guys. Uh, but tell us, and this is why I love getting you here, man, because I've been through Color and Light. I've played the Black Flies over you know, your stuff as well. You get to the point where I just I want something new. I want something fresh. It's still a great introduction for my friends, right? I've got, you know, recorded on my iPhone from the market, heaven. You know, it's so beautiful. I get goosebumps just talking about it. I got goosebumps when I was there. Sit in my own St. Catharines downtown market and have you guys up there just belting out. And you're like, I don't even know what this, like, I know what it's, but I don't know what it means. And, you know, I've said to you privately, like, what are you doing, man? You've got a <laughs> format down that you're fucking ripping off from someone, I know. And you're, because it's just so simple, but it's so... They, soulful and and deep it seems deeply personal and emotional to me when i'm listening to it so talk to us a little bit about your um, i've just taken my place in the tower of song as leonard cohen would put it right yeah so, uh, i don't i don't personally believe in copyright per se so basically everything's already been done in right. a way so it's just rearrangement is all it really is wow. we're just students so cool Keeping the and, torture yeah. burning. Yeah, get down on that mic, uh, Nate. You know how to use it. Uh, oh, I do. <laughs> talk, so the new stuff. 
So Color and Light, one of my favorite albums, um, you know, played it to death. Oh, I'm so excited about the new stuff, and the new stuff is familiar to me because I've seen it live lots of times. So tell me where you guys are at and what you got coming up this weekend. I think it's really cool. Can, do you want to share about, like, your creative process well, here, where you're at? This, and this you're is doing? always uh, an Aaron project, but he always gets me involved with what he's doing. We seem to work well together. Okay. So he always comes and shows me what he's working on, and we kind of talk it out and trim the fat and add some bells and whistles and that. So um, it's been quite a while since Aaron's put out an album, and basically we're excited to be doing it finally, and we're able to do it, and we're halfway in the middle of doing it, and it's going well. But this weekend, we're all just workshopping on uh, Lake Erie. We're going to have some fun and get some harmonies down for the new stuff. Right. You're thinking of doing a probably around eight-song album? That's right, and we're... One big thing is that we're making a record. We're going to be printing this on a vinyl, and we've never done that before. So, with Joe Lipinski, vinyl, yeah. Right. So we're really excited about Joe that. Joe Lipinski, shout out to Joe. And as far really as cool. the one of the things that we're also really looking forward to is different collaborations with this project. One of the ones that we've discussed is with Jason Lupish and Erica Sherwood making a video together. They've done that one or two times. So I mean, I mean, they're so Tim so Hicks, talented Danny and. Brown, the, yeah. Yeah, they make great videos and films, and uh, we're excited to collaborate with them. And uh, wow. have another friend, Ian McKenzie, who is a filmmaker that's based in British Columbia, and we have a film that we're, looks like it's going to be placed in a film that he's making called Children of Nowhere about the Orphan Wisdom School that I'm a scholar of in the Ottawa Valley. And, uh, yeah, who knows where, where things are going to go, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot of different moving pieces, being able to record an album and having a sense of how to promote it and then market it and then tour it. So we really learned by falling completely on our faces. After we released Color and Light, we had no plan and <laughs> basically spent all of our money, put it out, and it, it didn't get out of the Niagara region because we didn't have a plan. So we're trying to address some of those things that uh, we didn't address last time. And also, it's so humbling to make music and be in the arts. You know, you have your visions when you're yo a younger person of how your career is going to go and this idea of s stardom, whatever the hell that is, and things go to shit a bunch of times. And you end up, uh, you see a lot of people who don't stay in the arts, too. Um, get beat because up, of spit out. Yeah, totally. It's, I mean, it's a tough thing to have enough money to live, and it can be really discouraging. And hence the need for uh, platforms like the show here. And uh, we're very blessed in that the scene here, the art scene is small, relatively small in Niagara, but people are very supportive amongst each other here, which helps a lot. Amen to that. Aaron Berger is our guest with Nathaniel Gould and Matthew James Blake. I really appreciate your time. You got GoFundMe happening for this? What's... Yeah, we, ha we haven't put it out yet, but yeah, okay. in the next several weeks we're going to be looking for support for the record that we're making with Joe Lipinski and that'll be all over social media and right. such. Thank you very much. Burger, Blake and Gould, man. Matthew, James, MJ, Burger, Nate. Thanks. Uh, buddy. I'll come around and hug you in a second. Okay. We're going to bring up Greg Vesna next. That's Burger, Blake and Gould, Nathaniel Gould, Aaron Burger, Matthew, James, Blake. I am Jim Fannin. One quick break, Chris, quick break. And then, uh, We'll come back in one second and just say goodbye to these guys, Matthew Pretty James. Break. All right. I'm Jim Fannin. We're live from Sessions on the River. Back in a second after this break. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for your patience, guys, for coming out. We're uh, creating something from scratch here. Thanks to the people online. I haven't been real good about getting back to you. but uh, uh, Thank you to everyone that's come out today. But it's built upon the music and the guests and the issues, and we got a little bit of personality that goes along with it. Hopefully you're enjoying it. This is, this is the Jim Fannin Show. I'm working my lips for the first time today. Thanks for coming out, everyone. Uh, we're live from Sessions on the River. We're in Fort Erie, Wellington Court, man. They are laying some vicious, vicious food on us. Thanks to Dale and Eric Peacock from Wellington Court Restaurant. What a talent. Very well done. So thank you very much. 
Come on down here. We got a liquor license. You can watch your favorite bands. We got great bands coming up tonight. I've got a list of them here. But uh, before that, let's get this talk show done. We got. Uh, we're going till six. Live with this, uh, I'm going to bring up Greg Vesna in a minute. I'll give you more on him. And then Lou Pish and Sherwood and cast and crew of the film Fight are coming up. And I can't wait to get these guys up. Sarah Murphy Dyson is in the house later. She does a naked ballerina that will absolutely destroy your heart. It will rip it open and stomp on it on the ground. And then, and then somehow you get put back together. One of the most beautiful performances I've ever seen. Changed my life. Seen it twice. Excited to bring her in tonight to do that for you guys. Anthony Sweet and, wow, Theater Crisp at 11 o'clock. So blessed, so grateful to have the support. Nate Gould, BBG just got done here. Aaron Berger and the Blue Stars are off to a, a retreat, a session to tighten up this album a little bit, and they're going to come with a public funding campaign after that. Just one of uh, just beautiful talent all the way around today. So thank you. Uh, I'm completely blessed and humbled. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, before we get too much, we would continue. So we're going live till six and then we've got a full slate of bands on the hour after that. I am Jim Finn. And next up, an old friend of mine, we talked to you earlier, if you didn't uh, get the message in 1993, he called me and said, Jimmy, I need a favor. I said, Fez, anything? What? Uh, you got to run green in Niagara Center. I said, fuck you. No, seriously, what is the favor? You, we need a candidate, Mulrooney, if we don't have 50 candidates run nationally, the party's dissolved, and all our finances are absorbed by the state. Not that we had any money at that time, but it was really important to Vez in that election uh, that Mulroney tried to... Well, they said, if you don't run 50 candidates, you're not a party anymore. That's bullshit. So we ran the 53 or some odd candidates. Greg was you know, a, a founder of that movement and very involved, I think, finance part of it as well. I was so new in the game at 24 years old, not a political bone in my body that I didn't think I had, turned into a complete monster uh, and run many elections since. So in 93, I said yes to Vez, and the rest is his history. So uh, Greg Vesna is the chairman of a company called Hydro Fuel Inc. Uh, his daughter's here today. Zoe, thanks for coming out. Um, you didn't know that you could burn ammonia for to, to get electric power, right? Did you? You didn't know we could convert our complete fleet of transit and buses and tr trucks and ships and everything to ammonia, which we have already infrastructure partially built for. We don't need to rebuild it, so we're going down the wrong path. So he's the founder and chairman of Hydro Fuel Inc. He also wrote a book way back in the day called with John Deverell, uh, for his Toronto Star, political guy as well, called Democracy A, question mark, typical. It was a voter guide to action. And I talked about a lot of these uh, democratic issues that we face still today, 25, 30 years later. Uh, Greg Vesna is also the leader of the None of the Above Party, which we will not talk about tonight. I'm not spending any time on that. Greg Vesna, come on up here. Let's talk some politics, man. Hey. Well, I wouldn't have done this if it wasn't for guys like you and Gord Miller. I think it maybe you pull up on this one, yeah. Uh, the first call was to guys like you, Gord. Uh, I don't know who was. Uh, we've we've talked about this. I, I try not. I know Gord, and you're a busy guy too. But I got more access to you. And then I love when you tell me, "Okay, Fannin, I'm I'm fucking two fifty an hour. Make it quick." That's right. And uh, I know your rates have gone up since then, but. Uh, uh, Greg, I'm really so, it, this show doesn't happen without you guys saying yes to it, so I, I'm just coming on and doing the easy part, but... Uh, well, I it's mean, nice we, to have you back. I yeah. Mean, you know, I miss the old days of rock and roll and roll on the radio with Jim Fannin, the Jim Fannin show. Yeah. So now the Jim Fannin show's back out there, everybody in TV land, so here we go. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, I'm committed to another show, Stereo Sunrise, it's coming, I think it's November 19th, I should probably get that date correct to promote it, but... Uh, and if I get my ass out there and it's, we can raise some sponsorship. If there's a, if there's a, you know, uh, an interest in it, then it'll carry itself. We can't do, I can't do this stuff free, right? So you understand that. So, oh, okay. So, all right. So all right. Greg Vesna. So, yeah. Yeah. What do you want to, what do you want to talk about? Let's talk. Well, first you know, I want to do a quick, real quick shout out to Mike earlier because he did point out that yes, I signed a farm water deal. Um, but I wanted to point out something that's very important that most Ontarians and Canadians don't realize and that we've just found out 
by our experience with Nestle having priority over water, over municipalities and towns. Mm. When our environment minister, our premier has a moratorium for two years on water permits, but our environment minister admitted, I know he heard this from Mike, that the free trade agreements prevent us from protecting our water. Wow. And people don't know that. And Maud Barlow and the Council of Canadians have been screaming about this, and Mel Hertig, the late Mel Hertig before he died, have been screaming about this for 30 years. So they, they have recourse? They under... will take our water, Jim, okay? They own our water. We don't own our water. The president of Nestle was quoted in the press as saying, no human being has a right to water. They have a right to buy it from us, okay? So the greatest gift that conservatives say that Brian Mulroney gave us was actually terminal. He gave away our water. And people don't know that he gave away our water. And it's gone. And, he's and one if of the we greenest sign prime ministers the greenest prime minister of Canada, if you're talking about stuffing your pockets full of paper bags full of green. So I just wanted to shout out to Mike because he's absolutely correct. And if we go ahead and, and, and they manage to close, thank God for the Wallagonians that have killed CETA. If they put CETA through and then we put TPP through, we won't own anything in our country. Nothing. We won't have the right to the resources. We won't have the right to manufacture with the resources. We will have the right to give everything we own to investors from transglobal corporations. Now back up a little bit because uh, you know that's important. And I didn't start with something happy. TPP. Yeah. We're at a precipice now, right now with a. Well, like, where's, where's our, prime minister, our prime minister says that he's going to sign TPP. We'll see. We'll see. Um, as far as the ECB, the European deal, which which it appears may have fallen apart. Well, you know, this morning now there's a new emergency meeting on. Maybe it's not going to fall apart. Um, the bottom line is is that corporations aren't people. And as long as our courts and our laws treat them as people and give them rights over life, liberty, and security of the person, if economic security is meaningless to a citizen, but it's everything to a corporation. So we have a constitution and charter that gives us all these meaningless rights if we sign trade deals that take away our rights to go to our own courts and enforce them. And that's what these you know, transnational tribunals do. So I didn't want to start off really heavy. I wanted to start off something. Like, Fuck, now we well, all want to go hang ourselves. You know, so, take but, down you know, the shower rods, man. Oh, man. Yeah, we're just getting there, guys. So, but, so anyway, so, you know, now, there's good news in the world, too. It's not all gloom and doom, okay? Um, you know, I've been fighting for, for democracy since I was 13 years old, and the mayor in my hometown taught me about democracy. I'll tell everybody how I started in politics. You'll love this story. My hometown was North Bay, and it had the distinction of having a mayor named Merle Dickerson. Merle Dickerson is the only mayor ever elected and removed from office four times. The first time mayor was removed from, Merle, was removed from office was when he was charged with arson for burning down his hotel on Main Street for the insurance money. In the next election, Merle ran and won again. A few years later, Merle was busted. Common, found in, in a common gaming house. He had a gambling room in the back of a Chinese restaurant on Trout Lake Road. After Merle serves his 30 days, he's removed from office. Comes back the next election, runs and wins. A few years later, Merle took a 15-year-old to vote to seven different voting stations, declaring she was seven different people. Merle got busted for corrupt electoral uh, practices, prevented from running from office for four years, waited four years, run, and won. And this then is died not in true. And it's a true story, ask Gord, and he died in office. Oh. Now, let me tell you when I found out and how I found out there was money in politics. Uh, my family was well known in North Bay, the best in the family. My uncle was the editor of the newspaper, my other uncle's the fire chief, and blah, blah, blah. So Merle knew all my family. Near, near Birchhaven, where we lived, there was a little corner store, Max Milk store. And I'm there one day, and in comes Merle with the campaign crews, and they're out knocking doors. And he recognizes me, he knows my dad. Hey, Vesna, get over here. So he says, what are you doing over here? Shouldn't you be in school? I said, I hang out here at recess and see if I can get someone to buy me a pop and a bag of chips. And he looks at me and he says, here's $20. It's 12 cents for a pop, or 13 cents for a pop, and 12 cents for a bag of chips, right? Right, okay. So this will get you, like, 
you know, whatever, whatever it was, you know, 40 of them, whatever it is. He said, yeah. He said, so every kid that comes over at recess, you buy them a pop and a bag of chips and tell them to tell their parents that Merle Dickerson bought it for them. So I went through that 20 bucks at one recess. The next morning, instead of going to school, I went down to the mayor's office to get myself a job buying pops and bags of chips. And there it's how I found out that there's money in politics. And at the end, when Merle breath. Dickerson got thrown out for corrupt practices, because uh, I'd worked for him in campaigns, I went to work for Honest Doc Jack Smiley, our local vet. He was Honest Doc Jack. And Honest Doc Jack had come everything but first in running for council in every election he'd run in with no campaign, no nothing. Put his name on the ballot. He either came second, third, or fourth. So I said, Jack, if you let me run a real campaign for you, and we put up campaign signs, and we actually pretend we want to win, you'll top the polls this time, and we'll make you mayor next time. We'll get rid of Merle. And he topped the polls, and in the next election, Jack Smiley became mayor because Merle was gone. And this was during in between he was gone for corrupt practices. So I saw politics from both sides. I saw politics as from a child as business, and money, and manipulation, and say whatever you have to say in order to get people to vote for you. And on the other hand, I was connected with one of the most honest, decent human beings you'd ever met in your entire life, who showed me that politics was about principles, mm. is about doing what's important. And as you know, the reason I wasn't a conservative cabinet minister in the Mike Harris government is because I chose to listen to Doc Jack Smiley. Da, da, da. Greg Vesna is my guest. Thanks for that story. It's, it really sets the uh, the backdrop about you know who you are and where you came from. Man, you, we've done a lot of stuff, eh? Buddy, ninety three. We get a phone call. Uh, Mulroney, the NDP, the Liberals, and Conservatives on a on a Halloween, I think Friday, passed a new bill that took all the assets of a party away if it didn't get if it didn't run fifty candidates. He needed fifteen percent of the vote to get a subsidy and so on and so forth. So, and I, I was fortunate enough, yeah, right, I was treasurer. No, I was chief agent, and the treasurer resigned. So now I was chief agent and treasurer of the party, the Green Party, as it disappears off the map, right? So I got out the Rolodex and I started making the phone call, the same phone call I made to you. Hi, I need a favor. Sure, Vess, you're gonna run for the Green Party. Are you out of your fucking mind? And you weren't the first person that said it to me. But we Probably managed, one of the last, oh, actually. I was down God. that there list. There's a of lot more. of people that have never <laughs> spoken to me since that campaign. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem was they also made a rule that you had to have a $1,000 deposit and you only got 500 of it back if you got 15% of the vote. Wow. So as it is today, the rules were all rigged to favor the major parties and to crucify the little guys. Um, and so we not only had to find 50 candidates, we had to come up with 50 grand. And Green Party candidates and supporters, as you know, don't generally drive Bentleys, right? They, they drive uh, Diefen buggies. So in, in any event, so we, we did. We, we raised, we borrowed 50 grand, basically. Uh, my wife lent a lot more of it than she thought we were going to, but we did it. And we got our 50 candidates, and we ran, and we got half our deposits back. And the Communist Party went to court and had all of those rules ruled unconstitutional, every one of them. So, and so let's talk about today for a minute. We've got Ontario with Kathleen Wynne promising to do politics differently, which she has. <laughs> she never said she'd do it worse than anyone's ever done it before. But when you're at 14% in the favorability level, listen, there's a story about in the, in the American South that used to, run what they call a yellow dog Democrat. It's meant you could run a yellow dog as a Democrat and it would win. In fact, they actually ran dead guys and they won. But I can tell you <clears throat> that Kathleen Wynne is so low in the polls that if she doesn't leave, if she stays and runs again, I predict the Liberal Party will not get the dozen seats it needs for official party status. And Ontario will do the opposite of what we did federally. Ontario will move to essentially a two-party right and left system. That's what I believe will happen. Now, prediction, if she leaves and they bring in someone from the outside who fires half the cabinet and sweeps the floor clean, they'll win a majority. 
Wow. There it or is. Or that easy as an That electorate. easy. And so our politics has reached the point where we've gone from being a representative democracy with people representing us. My mm -hmm. MP mattered. I know who my MP was. I could call them up. To party politics where the leader's office controls the game. And to where now the leader's office doesn't even control the game. The party controls the game. And the leader mm -hmm. doesn't in many ways have a say except if you're in power. So what happened? Greg Vesna is my guest. He's the founder and chairman of a company called Hydro Fuel Inc. None of the above party founder and leader. Uh, just We're going to take a quick break, uh, two minutes, and I'm just going to use the bathroom, and then we'll come right back with okay. more with you. All right. Then Mike Schreiner and Gord Miller and yourself are going to come up here and talk a little... We're just going to bullshit we'll each other. Like we're fun. sitting in the garage yeah, having exactly. some beers. So can I, can I, in Ontario, can you, can you drink when you talk? Yeah, absolutely. Get a drink, man. Hey. Let's, let's set this. We got Taps my Brewery, local here. beer uh, right on tap here. Taps Brewery, thank you very much. Thanks to Wellington Court. Quick break. Chris Curry's producing today. Thank you very much. We'll be right back. Is this, uh, this, this insane IPA, is that a local? I've never heard of it. Are we live? We're going now? Yeah, we're, on. <laughs> we're on. All right. We're on with our insane IPA. Testing, one, two, three. We're just getting our shit together here at Sessions on the River. I'm Jim Fanny. It's good beer. That's Chris Curry. He owns the place. He's taking care of us. Mike Schreiner, leader of the GPO. Vez needs no introduction. We did talk about, we'll get back to none of the above. Gord Miller, for, former environmental commissioner. Friends shout, of mine. Sh shout out to the to the house. Yep. This is really cool, eh? Yeah. It's a this beautiful, is a beautiful facility. place. It really Hello? is. What an investment they put in here. And you can tell by looking around the place, right? I mean, everything's yeah. first class. People should come down here tonight. Yes. They really come should. Come on down. Absolutely. It is really, really yeah, nice. Local beer on tap. Taps beer. Uh, thanks to Wellington Court Restaurant. Good. Dale and Eric Peacock. Awesome people. Thank you for Cheers. doing it. Thanks to all the Oh, we got a stack slate. It's on the web. Let's go to the Facebook page. We got some great talent coming up. Uh, just before we start, Vez, touch on none of the above, Pyre. Come so on, the whole for idea, real. The whole idea that none <laughs> of the above is, as, as I was saying, we've moved away from party politics and we've moved away from representative democracy, right? So I'm saying what we need is the three R's of direct democracy. We need referenda. People need the right to force a vote on an issue if their politicians won't do it. And we need recall. We need the ability to get rid of politicians because you can't even get rid of them at an election. <laughs> Whereas with a recall race focused on a candidate in particular, you could. And finally, we need the third R of, of uh, direct democracy, which is real legislative and electoral reform for true accountability and we don't have accountability when the auditor general has to sue the government to get the spending estimates there's just something wrong okay so the idea about, about the none of the above was to give people that option now i've i'm speaking to the premier i spoke to the chief electoral officer there's a possibility the province will put none of the above on the ballot for 2018 the none of the above party will cease to exist change the name to direct democracy or whatever and we will have a true option now i won't tell anybody that's listening that you have the right in ontario to decline your ballot right which means you stand up in front of the whole room and say i'm not voting for anybody except that's how we used to vote 200 years ago we used to stand up in the room and tell everybody how we're voting and then as soon as we went outside they were waiting for us in the parking lot with baseball bats mm. that's why we went to a secret ballot the reason the major parties in ontario passed decline your ballot so that you would be ridiculed if you didn't vote for one of them Okay, and it, yet in the 2014 election, as soon as people found out that you actually had the right to decline your ballot or there was a none of the above, we got an average of 1.5% of the vote. So we, we, we need an option to say, I don't like any of these people. And it's not enough to say, okay, none of the above won, now the second place guy goes in. We need what they have in Nevada and other places around the world. If none of the above wins, which it doesn't happen often, but if it wins, there's a new election and none of the candidates or the parties that were on the previous ballot are allowed. So my great dream is for some democracy to come to Canada. I was hoping that it was going to come federally. I'm still hoping. 
Well, hang on here. The Green Party has. You should know, Vez, and, and Ontario Green Party has a none of the uh, none of the above and option on nominations. Right? All, yes. all of yes. our ballots have yes. always had a none of the above they're, they're, option, yeah. and none of the above has actually won One. a few Green Party yeah. nominations. And that means that somebody stands up. So I want to be the, the nominated candidate. You know, they're lined up behind Fannin because they're such a you know. So many people guy. want to like, be. Why would you? <laughs> but you know, people can say no. We'll have you. you know, we don't like any of those people. Uh, him. That's yeah. right. And just find us somebody else, right? Yeah. Look but, at the look at the Americans now. Yeah. They don't probably they, wish don't they could vote for that. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't you think they were, they wanted on the option none of the above? <laughs> Absolutely. None of the above won both the Nevada uh, Democratic and Republican gubernatorial races in one and another election. It's really? actually one big. And what did they tickets. do? Well, they pointed to second place there. They don't huh. have a new one. But listen to this. Poland implemented none of the above when there was a single-party government, and every candidate was defeated. <laughs> 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 they didn't even elect one. And Russia used to have an option of none of the above, but the same thing started happening, <laughs> so they killed it. So just so you know, the UN Convention on Human Rights and Political Rights says you have the right international law to a, a secret ballot yep. and you have the right under international law to vote for none of the above and that was was used in India they went to their Supreme Court and it was ordered on the ballot in India so the, sh the answer is if the federal and Ontario governments do not implement this for the next federal and Ontario election as soon as we see their bill their new law we're gonna go to court and we're going to ask the court to put it on the ballot. Is that the only recourse we have, is to use the courts against you, the yes, political yes, parties? Because yes, pretty much. And I'm going to throw this open to discussion. Yeah. You've been hoping and dreaming. You wrote about a book 30 on democracy years. 35 years ago. Yeah. Here we are again. We're still talking about the same things. It's rigged. I hate to use that, you know, as a, it's kind of a hot term rigged. these days. Municipal politics is rife with money and influence. We see it at the federal and provincial levels. It's not all as corrupt, though, municipally, in a sense. Okay? Oh. It's, it's I a don't know. Kind of, it's, it's, a it's a different kind of corruption. I'll talk okay? to a lot it's of municipal councillors. It's developers. developers. No, it's developers, developers yes. and, but it's not trans-global corporations. No, no, no. Okay? You, know, you get sold out locally, but you don't get sold out where we do federally. And it's interesting. You know, the scariest thing politically in terms of philosophy, because I'm a po political scientist, right? So the scariest thing to me in the world is Donald Trump. And the most exciting thing in the world to me is Donald Trump. <laughs> no. Right? Because, and they're in for a big surprise on election day, I can tell you right now. Yeah, they're in so. for a very, very big surprise because people are not showing up for Hillary's rallies. People no, no, that's right. don't go vote to elect a shiny pony very often. And Hillary is no shiny pony. <laughs> okay? So, you know, and she's got big, big percentage of the vote amongst youth, but they won't have the turnout of the youth vote that we had in Canada. Okay? They won't. Point. In fact, this is something that happened in the last election, the first time Speaking in Canadian history. Ponies. Young people were more involved in asking questions about politics during that campaign than senior citizens to have the highest level of involvement in that federal election amongst young people ever. Greg so the one thing I want to say is I, I want to get back to Canadian politics, but yeah. while we're on the U.S., yeah. I think the one difference, though, will be that Hillary actually has a machinery to get out the vote, and Trump doesn't have that. That's what the Brexit that, said. That is going to be... You know, I, I think in this case it's going to be an important uh, distinction. And the other distinction is, is in the U.S., it's not by popular vote, it's by electoral college. Right. And yes. the electoral college favors the Democratic Party. Yes. And so she has a built-in advantage. So I think you if may... I think I think Trump's numbers are going to be higher than the polls are predicting. Right. But I still think where. Hillary's going to win. Well, it looks like Hillary's going to win. But I'm saying the, the reality is in protest elections, wrote a book on this, in protest elections, people do not show up and vote for the status quo. That's they true. They show That's up right. to throw out the status yeah. quo. Mm -hmm. And there is no lineup of, uh, of uh, there's no riots to get to the front line to vote for Hillary. Okay. There well, just isn't. If, if well, the, the other, Republicans the other thing had is, a semi-competent candidate, they would win. Oh, it would be over. Yes, yeah. Yeah. right. Yeah. But, but the other thing is that nobody, there's an awful lot of silent support for Trump. And nobody, you know, people are just going to, are mad. 
on the situation, the Amer economic situation especially, the political situation in the United States, they're going to vote Trump, but they're not saying it because if, if you come out and say I'm a Trump supporter, you get attacked or ridiculed well, or whatever, true. right? Yeah. Keep your mouth shut up, don't go put about. up Trump sides. Like, right? I'm, not, I'm not promoting Trump here. I, I think it's, I'm none of the above yeah, in the States. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but Gordon but, and I are from the same school. See, we have an advantage of all, over all you people because we're from North Bay. <laughs> and right. in North you Bay, I thought nobody old. ever voted for Merle Dickerson. I thought you were going to say it's because no, no. you're old. Nobody <laughs> voted for Merle Dickerson. He won 21 elections yeah. and he no never won a poll. Poll. No public opinion poll ever showed Merle Dickerson was going to win. No, but he Not always won. What? And he won. So but anyway, I have, I have a, I have a, sorry. One more Merle Dickerson yeah. story. I have a good friend who, who he got his driver's license when he was sixteen, and 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 his dad said, "Here, take the car, go down to Merle's." Campaign. So he goes to that campaign, and so they put a they put a guy in his car, one guy. And his job is, you know, 16, he thinks the big thing is an election campaign, is to drive around a different poll, and that guy went and voted in every poll. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So vote early, vote often. Yeah. So, wow. anyway. That's uh, politics. Oh, but well. That was years ago. It's like that today. Gord Miller, Greg Vesna, Mike Schreiner. Uh, really great having you guys here. Uh, we kind of skirted a bunch of the issues today. Uh, we didn't even get into hydrofuel. Let's talk a little bit about alternative energy. What's gone wrong with the green plan? Samsung mates off with how, and, and I am of the belief that every, as a robot, every issue, healthcare, electoral reform, foreign affairs, electoral reform, uh, taxes, electoral reform, electro everything to me is based on the fact that we get these fucking guys, majority governments right. to bend us over without our consent on free trade, on GST, on whatever the hell they want, money, taking care of their friends, Samsung, it's been that way a long time. And until the, every issue that drives you crazy, if someone knew it was connected to the way we elect these turkeys and the way that you're uh, majority represented by a minority of the support, you know, we are electing governments with but we have a way out. Vote. vote green every time we're given well, the option. Yeah. That hasn't been working so well this for us either. Here, Mike's been doing a good job on the outside, but that, to this me, guy here it's has all about more uh, about the environment than most people alive. And the one thing that he did was he issued his reports, okay, and his reports had the numbers. Yeah, okay. they did. Based now we've had two auditor generals that said that our liberal government implemented their green plan with absolutely having no zero, not a number at all. Right. Mm -hmm. And then our company with the University of Ontario Institute of Technology just released a major research paper on the life cycle analysis of green energy, of brown energy and of ammonia energy. Now, the most exciting part of all this is it turns out when you take hydrocarbons and convert them into ammonia and urea, you capture the carbon and it makes us mining all our hydrocarbons viable and usable. When you take renewable energy and instead of selling it to the Americans or paying them $2 billion a year to take our excess green power, you turn it into ammonia and then make peak power, it works. So the interesting thing about the report was, is that, by the way, ammonia works. So anybody in TV land, look up ammonia fuel. But the other part of the report was it showed the big mistake the Ontario government did. They didn't do a life cycle analysis. And when you close coal plants and partially replace them with natural gas plants, Nobody did an emissions analysis. They claim that's green. But there's a lot more to emissions than CO2. There are seven different categories of emissions. Methane emissions from natural gas are far worse for us over a short period of time, over the next 20, 50, 100 years, than CO2. Will we discover technologies to help over the next 100, 200, 500 years to deal with CO2? Maybe. Will we but have, we can't. Do we mitigate. have 100 years left? But do we, we don't. don't. <laughs> and ozone... Ozone emissions are instantaneous. They're now. Yeah. The impact is now. You stop the ozone, you stop the problem a day later. But we've increased the ozone emissions here 10 times in the last five years alone with methane emissions, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So the one thing we've never done is we've never done a true life cycle analysis. And the second thing we've never done is use the tax system to put the cost of pollution in the price of what we pay. And if we did yep. that alone, stop subsidizing brown energy, stop subsidizing green energy, put the price of pollution in the price, that's where green energy went. That's where it's cheaper. Right. So I just want to correct yeah. you on one thing, because you're usually right on these things, Vez. Hey, I make mistakes. There was one person who pointed out the numbers 
on natural gas, <laughs> having the emissions go up. No, it's this guy right here. He's here, yeah. The environment yeah. from Ontario. I said that. And then yeah. after, no, he pointed it out, yeah. and then afterwards, there would be a scrum out in the halls of Queen's Park with the media, and he would usually say something like what you Who just said, said that yeah. you got to put a price on pollution. And the other three parties, the three parties with seats at Queen's Park, when the media would come and ask them about that, they would all go running. Run. Yeah, None of them would want to talk about it. And there was one guy, one lonely little guy <laughs> without a seat at Queen's Park who would sit in the hallway right. and say, That's we right. have to put a price on pollution. Yeah. Yeah. If we're going to solve this problem, we have to put a price on pollution. And the other mistake the liberals made, which you hinted at, was they picked winners and losers. Right. And, and governments usually are never very good they at picking the winners pick and losers. The right and the biggest problem the liberals made is, is they put corporate interests ahead of community interests. And if you look at the best way that green energy has been rolled out in other countries, Denmark and Germany in particular, power. it's been community power. Communities, local people you know, own it. Yeah. It isn't let, corporate let, let, power. Let me tell you a quick story about that because <laughs> I was part of a del as commissioner. I went overseas early early two thousands. You know, I forgot what exactly what year. Went to the Netherlands, right? We were looking at we were looking at some waste technology. And we were looking and we looked at their wind turbines, and we didn't have any here right at that time, right? And we were talking about it, right? And so and the Dutch said. They said, whatever you do, don't do it with private corporations. Right. Do it as community power. Because right. right. they had right. made all the mistakes and they knew the right way to do it, right? Wow. And, and they told us, do, you know, that's the one thing you got to get right. Do it as community power. Of course, what did we do? Wow. Not that. <laughs> There's an even, fun, you're absolutely and People right. really don't know the deal that no. Samsung got. There's an even, no, they big, don't. but it's not and, just and you know the what Samsung the guy, deal. the first person who criticized that deal was actually the leader of the Green Party of Ontario. And it freaked out a lot of environmentalists. They're like, why are you criticizing this? And I'm like, it is wrong to do backroom deals, whether it's with Doesn't fossil fuel with. companies or with green energy companies. Yeah. Backroom deals are wrong, period. But what's even worse is this, is fundamental science. And this man will tell you. There are two ways to utilize wind energy. One is to create four times as much as the wind energy if you're going to put it on a province-wide grid like Ontario because your province-wide transmission losses are half. That's just what it takes in a province this big. Okay? And Don't tell the nuclear guys. So. And for every, for every kilowatt of power that you create for wind, you have to kill rate, create a kilowatt for backup. So, oh. so for every... For every kilowatt hour you create for nuclear, you have to have a backup too. You know that too. You exactly. know that too. But let me finish my story. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. So, but what, but, you know, but what they didn't do was they didn't look at the full picture. Okay. Mm. And I'll give you a couple examples. In Great Britain, they subsidized over a million wind farms. But they did not connect them to the grid because they realized it was going to cost them four times as much. So you know what they did? They subsidized backing them up with diesel power. Now, in northern Ontario, the government just announced they're building a 1,500-kilometer uh, hydro line from Thunder Bay where there's no generating capacity for peak time. They're going to give them off-peak interruptible power for 12,000 Na First Nations in northern Ontario. Um, and it's going to replace their diesel generators, which for 40 years under this contract are going to be backed up by diesel. Okay? The University of Ontario did a study saying that we could do it on ammonia for a quarter of the cost if we shipped the ammonia in for 40 years. Hmm. But if within 10 years you could use wind power up there to make enough ammonia to not only fuel the generators but also provide the fuel that industry and everybody else uses, we could do it at a tenth of the cost. Mm -hmm. Ontario, if you go to their website and look at their definition of fuels in Ontario, ammonia is not classified as a no, fuel in Ontario. No, 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 that's right. In 1863, it was classified as a, as a fuel in the United States and well, Europe. And, and remember, yeah. remember, Vez, when yeah. we were... I forgot which, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the big science yep. thing for worldwide science right. thing. It report, reports every, about every five years on climate change. Yeah, exactly. So one day I was sitting in my office and the, what, 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 I forgot which version, of too many years. Number the, four. Yeah, number four comes out, right? Comes the, the big report. And of course, you know, I got to go it. through this thing. You know, it's massive amount of science. Going through, going through, hit a page, got to call Vez. Says right there, Internet, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, what is one of their promising things? Ammonia. ammonia. Right there, right there. I said, if you do so ammonia. I, 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 you know, of course, yeah. you, know, you can imagine, right? Yeah. You know Vez, yeah. right? So, yeah. so, so the commissioner picks up the phone and says, 
Get the IPCC the report. Yeah. Turn to page 462. <laughs> Go. Right. Wow. And, you know, so, and so the interesting thing is, in that case, they found that um, first, the ammonia plants, a lot of the ammonia plants we, you, we have aren't efficient. So if you increase the efficiency of the plants, you use the, what they call a CRES technology, you reduce renewable energy, et cetera, et cetera. We could mitigate more CO2 doing that than any carbon sequestration technology right. that existed. Okay, so that is true, but it's not saying a lot because the carbon sequestration technology that they're promoting are so oh, bad. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. But so anyway, but the so the bottom line is that you know I'm a little out there, as you know, and uh, a little and, no. I, and I come up with some policies that are a little extreme. And about thirty five or forty years later, someone says you were right all along. Yeah. yeah. Can so, we can we take this back to one thing I mentioned earlier though? Sure. Is is look at who donates to political parties? Oh, of course. And, and so the nuclear industry is one of the most powerful lobbies in this province. And if you also even look, and I know it drives me crazy sometimes when the conservatives do this, but they have a point, is if you look at the wind companies that donated to the liberal government and which ones got contracts and which ones didn't donate to yeah. the government, didn't get contracts. Wow. Or, so Vez, or I, well, got I'm their t- offshore things canceled. Canceled yeah. because they didn't donate. <laughs> which exactly. the best ones of all. Which exactly. would have been the best the ones. Best exactly. The most financially responsible ones are the ones they cut. So anyway, Vez, your problem is, is you don't vote, you don't donate enough money to the liberal government. You're oh, that's right. right. Okay. Yeah, that, or, oh, right. we got we just, should, we just solved I, the problem. What I should have done. I, I, got, is, I got my I got my wallet. I should have I should have asked the liberals if they would dig go. Merle Dickerson up out of the grave <laughs> and run him as leader, and then we could have had a dead dinosaur who probably would have governed Ontario better than no, this present okay. government. Oh, whatever. So, oh, my, uh, on that note, let's wrap this shit up. Let's get you guys off stage. Thank you so much for coming out. Grab no problem. A beer. Uh, Mike My Schreiner, pleasure. leader of the Green Party of Ontario. I really appreciate your time. I know you're you're busy. I love your work. I see what you're doing. You're you're making press releases all the time on topical things. You're in in play. I, I really love that about you, Fez. Uh, good friend of mine for so long. Uh, thank you for being there for so many years. And uh, you know maybe we'll do this again, Gord. Again, it doesn't happen without you guys saying yes. But Gordon, you know, for taking time and saying, ah. I appreciate the and kilometers. driving a thousand kilometers. I base. appreciate the thousand kilometers and the time. And uh, I told you I'll put you up at Starry's finest hotel tonight. Yeah. Well, at least you got good local food, local music, local beer. That's right. All yeah, of that right. here. Thank so. you very much. And speaking of local, coming up next, we got Lupish and Crew. So Chris Chris Curry is running the board over there. He's the owner operator of Sessions on the River. He's going to get us a short break, and then we're coming back with Lupish Sherwood, On Point Creative, the film Fight. I'm Jim Fannin. We'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Test one, two, three. This is James Melville Fannin. We are coming to you live from Sessions on the River on the beautiful shores of the great, the great Niagara River in Fort Erie, Ontario, at the base of the Peace Bridge. I am Jim Fannin, pimping all that is good and musical today in Niagara. We uh, love everyone that came in. Thanks to the last panel, the green panel. And now we're so thrilled to have you guys here. This is cast and crew of the film Fight. It's a Lupus Sherwood production. (laughs) Jay's on the keys. The baby grand of the grand piano is our set today. Uh, Just grateful to have you guys. I know. um, Okay, so... Erica, uh, Erica Sherwood, we're going to talk about you right now, but Sarah Murphy Dyson's coming up at 7 o'clock. Anthony Sweet is next. Like Sarah Murphy Dyson, your movie kind of shifted my life. It kind of impacted me. It, it, it made me think, and I fell in love with your character. She's the coolest thing on the planet, right? <laughs> so thank you, Jason. And so all I see then is you and, and Beth Moore and... and uh, Brad Moore, and, and the synergy was amazing, and the scenery was my own hometown of St. Catharines, and then uh, the music score was great, and oh then God, I know yes. you rescored it, and then brought the local guys in, and, and that was awesome, like Faceless and Wait- Weightless and Faceless is an Aaron Berger song, and then Anthony Botting at the end with Echoes, and he played oh that today. God. It was great we got to see them today. Which is- oh, yeah, I'm you so got to happy. check that so out. Excited. Yeah, Botting is yeah. just magical, and Anthony Sweet, as who I described that way, is, is coming up next. So I want to give you guys some time. Number one, thank you, Jason and Erica, for a kind of wonderful thing. You are our of, biggest fan, and we love well, it Well, so I don't know about that, but you guys did a really <laughs> nice job on the, on the premiere. It was red carpet at Brock. It wasn't the same old people that I see, you know, when I used to go to those events. Uh, it, and I thought it spoke to a lot of class. And, 
you know, I, went, I didn't know what to expect. I was expecting, Jason, no offense, to see the beachcombers type of shots and the bad acting and the, and the weak <laughs> scripts. And it just all looks so Canadiana. And I yeah. really expected to see that. And what I got was fucking Hollywood in St. Catharines. It's, you know, you. I'm really proud of you guys. So thank, thank you. you for that gift. And I know it's getting picked up and, and getting distributed. I bought it. I watched it alone on Valentine's Day. Is that when Aww. it came out? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I watched Ke- uh, Letter Kenny, the full season. And, and then I, you know, had to, yeah, take oh, a couple well. volumes. I'm like, yeah, no. <laughs> anyway, well, so uh, that's re-seeing it again. Oddly enough, me. Letter Kenny is produced by another kid from St. Catharines, Mark Montefiore. Wow, I didn't know that. And yeah. what a genius program. Nothing original like that's come out of yeah, you know, it's, anywhere it's a good show. since Trailer Park Boys. I really yeah, I'm having a lot sure. of fun with it. So the new film, yes, Fight. Fight. Um, <laughs> uh, tell us about the, the people sitting around the table here. And yeah, so what, we, what was the, okay, where's the motivation? Because is this the one that's going to make us big money here oh, as, uh, you know, community yeah, investors? So. Have you raised some sponsorship yet? Just tell us all about uh, Fight. Well, we're working on it. Um, it's well, we're here today with obviously Erica Sherwood, who stars and produces the film with me, and then Gabriella McAlpine, who is also starring in the film, um, and Tino Notariani, who is also starring in the film. Um, and there's a bunch of people who wish they could have been here, but uh, they're busy working, doing plays and such. So, no, it's 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 great. It's uh, it's taken us quite a while to get to this point. Um, fight is an idea that I've been working on. For six years, probably. I think I came up with the idea while we were shooting a kind of wonderful thing. Um, and just working on the script for quite a while. Cool. And then decided to abandon the script completely. <laughs> cool. <laughs> and it's film noir. Is that what you like? Um, I see this hashtag. It's that it's the hashtag. It's black and white, isn't it? It's it black is. and white, but of... it's not film noir. Okay. What's no. Okay. I don't know the difference. I it's think I action, saw it happen. It's a, it's a dramatic action film. It's along the lines of. Um, Raging oh, Bull. <laughs> uh, like a Nicholas Winding Refn film. Sort of along those lines. Maybe not as dark as his films. Um, like Drive. It's a, it's a slow, slow sort of build tension to the build, climax. Yeah. A lot of tension, a lot of character development, and then a lot of people snapping at the end. Cool. And you mentioned you threw the script out. We did. So. For real, like this is a yeah. movie that's going without a script. Yeah, well, we have a we have a basic outline, right? <laughs> so <laughs> loopish, <laughs> and, it, and it's changing even as we as we go as we wow. shoot. And cool. Um, yeah, it's this new sort of um, thing that we're trying. I just I feel I feel like we've we've done movies in the past where it's like here's the script, and you know, because the, the whole process of making a movie is you write a script and then you shoot it and then you edit it and through those stages you sort of come up with um, a different film every time so whatever you write is one thing and then you shoot something different and then you edit something a little bit different after that and I just I, th- I feel like that's true for most films um, but with this I, I really wanted to experiment more with the process of being more creative and um, not artistic, I guess, because we're trying to make a commercial film. Like we're trying to make something that's that a, a wide audience is going to enjoy. That's why we made it about fighting, because I think people um, want to see action in films and stuff like that. But I also think that they connect with characters and, and people on a real level. So, but yeah, the idea was to yeah just kind of wing it and not really wing it. I like we we sort of know where we're going with it. Right. Um, but I like the idea that things can change and, and evolve and, and mm. develop organically as we go. And so, yeah, we're just trying something different. I just got bored with making movies the way that people make movies. It's kind of like, um, uh, I guess, with music as well. It's like you go into a studio and you, and you, you make a song the typical way that you, you would. And, and we did this thing back in the spring with, uh, with Tony Decker from the Great Lakes Swimmers. Uh, we did a little documentary about him coming home to Port Colborne for the first time in years. And uh, just the process that he he took when making uh, his first album, where they went out to this silo in Waynefleet and just smashed some rocks together to make sounds. And I'm like, that's kind of like, that's kind of the approach that I want to take with making movies. It's just like, let's just go out with a camera and people and an idea and then mm. put that together to make something. 
Cool. Now, Erica, what can you tell us without giving, I don't know if you can tell us anything about the character that you're developing and your personal investment in it. I mean, we joked and I, you know, I get to get behind the scenes with you guys and we'll <laughs> talk about that later. I got an, I got an, I got a song coming out actually that'll be I'm performing later. I don't know if you knew that, but, uh, I also say I have a movie coming out, so dealing with my scene on the floor. Um, <laughs> what person, and I know that you made a personal investment with a, a kind of wonderful thing, you know, that, that whole drama of the sickness, the terminal illness, and wow. Uh, what, what kind of investment are you making in this character? Well, this is like the complete opposite of what I envisioned for myself in, in real life, which is to have a kid and to just be a single mother. Um, and feeling the the pressure in that, wow. how how will I ever feel what it, that actually is like without research and stuff like that? So, hmm. I couldn't re I couldn't really research that kind of thing because I think it's too hard um, unless you're actually in it. And I think um, so. The only real experience I've had was which just just hanging out with um, Jason's kids and kind of feeling what it's like to be that kind of. Um, a uh, parent that's either divorced or um, um, separated from their mm -hmm. uh, the mother or the father. So that's the only experience that I've had. Um, so I kind of had to dig in my life for loss and things that I would fight for um, that could, you know, relate to that kind of um, uh, pressure, which is very, very hard for me because I, I never wanted a kid. Um, so to get there was very, very hard for me. But everybody, everybody has experienced um, pressure and loss and something that they absolutely need to um, keep in their life. And what would they, what would they do um, to keep that in their life? So for my character, Alex, who is basically um, this single mother who loses their job and needs to um, make ends meet for their for their daughter, um, what would she do? How, how, how far would she go? So my character um, goes further than I think any, any other mother would do, which was to risk her own life for her own kid, which is to go into, into underground uh, bare knuckle boxing for easy money, fast money. Right. Not easy money, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Fast money. Um, because she's experienced that before, before she was pregnant. Where she was able to make money um, as an underground bare knuckle bo boxer. So she decides to go back in that world that was very risky and risks her own life for her own kid to make ends meet. So, how about, is, it, is it impacting you? Like we joked... Stay in character! Like, do you drag <laughs> it home with you? Do you carry the baggage with you when you come home? Or can you turn it off? I can turn it off only because I have never <laughs> wanted a kid. Oh. So it's easy to, for me to take it off. But at the same time, um, to get to that place where it's heart and soul and, and caring so much about a human being, like we've all done that before. We've, we've cared about a human being that much before. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of, well, who have you cared for? You know, my, my father, my mother, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. How far would you go for the person that you love is basically right. the, the baggage. Erica Sherwood's my guest, Jason Lupish. They are on Point Creative. Gabby, thank you for coming. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for being patient and waiting through all these political guests. What's your contribution <laughs> to the movie? Are you having fun with this thing or what? Is yeah. It, is, this is what you've always wanted to do. Is first film? What? what yeah, it's my back? first film. I've like I've always wanted to be in a movie or do acting. And what are you playing? Uh, I'm playing the character Sam. Okay. And like, Which is in relation to Erica? No, what? no, no relation okay. whatsoever. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can't continue. Too much of the plot away. I don't know how. What? Yeah. Uh, what kind of uh, like what kind of experiences you know being on set all the time is. You know, I, we all think it's glamorous, the people that don't do it, that you try and lay this stuff down. It's hard work, huh? Yeah, it's like, it's a lot of time consuming, too. Like, I've always wanted, like, I've always wanted to be on a movie set, but I didn't think it'd be hard, like, what it really was. And, like, I'd go there and I'd be there for long hours. 
and I'd always like want to go out with friends, but then I'd have to stay <laughs> to like Sacrifice. do the movie. So then I'd be doing the movie, and then next day I'd be doing an, like filming again and over and and it like I didn't think you'd have to do the scene so many times. <laughs> like, <laughs> I didn't well, that's think where I get my lupus jab, and usually I gotta let that one fly. I'm gonna turn over a new leaf. It's all good. <laughs> so, like, I, thought, I thought you'd only have to do like film the scene like four times but then like yeah it's always like 20 times but then like it changes like jason would always be like no be sad no this time be angry this time he'd always switch it up and see what works better yeah well that's awesome and i know it's the same in music man these guys get in studio and it's over and over and over and over and i've you know i just sat through one session one day here i'm like oh geez i hear that song one more time tino how are you enjoying the set man how'd you get recruited by these dudes you, does someone know someone a favor here or like what's so it, it would appear that way but um no um i believe it was erica had had uh, messaged me and said, uh, you mind coming out for a screen test? We're working on a new feature. And I said, uh, yeah, sure, I'd love to. Unknowing what it was, uh, pr plot, premise, anything like that, she said, wear something uh, surfery. I was like, okay, fair enough. <laughs> so I show up and uh, basically my role for the day was uh, to share a slow dance in a bar while slightly intoxicated. So I, with who? With Erica. How come I didn't get not that Jay, call? Not Jay, not <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> as, as flattering as it would have been to share a dance with Jay, but uh, it was oh, for, it yes. was with Erica. So interesting um, too. Yes, with, uh, getting into character, had a few cocktails. Decided uh, wouldn't do it much justice if I was uh, completely sober. So uh -huh. went for it. But um, yeah. So anyway, then they pitched the idea that it was a movie about underground fighting. Uh, my character would be not the voice of reason, but he's definitely more. He's he's relatable, likable, to an extent, of course. Okay. Uh, for most people who watch it, once the movie comes out, I hope, which by the way, I hope it's enjoyed and well received, but um, that uh, he, he's not really such a terrific guy all the way through. I mean, nobody is so. Right. Um, but I, I play Erica's love interest or vice versa. And Bastard. Yeah, more or less, more or less. <laughs> My character is a Justin. He's a single father, has a little boy, Mikey. He's played by a very talented young actor. So... Um, most of the scenes I've had, I haven't had any scenes with Gabby, but I have with Erica. Um, her daughter, Sam, is played, obviously. Uh, what's her? Eve. Eve, yeah. yes. One of great uh, children actors. It's, it's incredible. So uh, I've had a lot of fun with that. But that's basically the, the synopsis of my character. Awesome. Ways. But of course, with, uh, as Jay said earlier, there's going to be some evolutions within the script. So Absolutely. That may change, but uh, oh, yeah. up until this Big point. Time. Yes. <laughs> Uh, and Tino's, Tino's been uh, on a few of our films. Cool. He's, he was in, uh, we were trying to figure this on the way here. Um, what was the first thing that we worked on? Was it the Bayview Flowers commercial that we shot probably four Plug. years ago that just got released now? Yep. Uh, yeah. And awesome. then we did, really? we did yeah. One Last Christmas, which is a short film. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that we released a couple of Christmases ago that we'll probably release again this year, uh, where Tino got to make out with. Jeff Malish? Jeffrey. Oh, yes. no. Okay, Jeffrey. so just yep. on the way out, I want to touch on this. And sorry, guys. <laughs> I know you waited around a long time, but I, I want to stay on schedule because Anthony Sweet's coming up at 6. Talk to me about uh, the script for Jeff Malish. You know, for, come on. For fight? You uh, didn't make him gay so, in this, did you? Well, no. Oh! No, no. You can't give anything away? Well, oh, he just happens to kiss a man? What do you mean? Kiss the man. Well, originally, yeah, the original idea was that Gabby's character was um, going to run away from home. So she is, um, um, she growing up, her father raised her. Um, no, originally it was her mother raised her. And then her mother ends up dying and she has nobody. So she has to leave home and try and find her estranged father. We then flipped that around and made it. She's going and looking for her mother. So Jeff was supposed to play her father. So I'm like, Jeff, like this was back in June, like grow a beard. And just, Which is killing him, yeah, by the grow way. Yeah, beard. He's like, I can't wait to shave this <laughs> off. They won't let me. Yet. They got a couple more. And so he did that, and we did some, we did some screen tests with, with him and another actress who was originally going to play uh, the role that Gabby plays. And um, he... <laughs> So he grew this beard and everything, and he just looks fantastic. <laughs> but then we, we then we cut the father role, and I'm no, like Jeff, don't worry. I'm like we'll find something else oh, for you. Okay. So we, we Not again. You cut me again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we found that, but we got we got this great role for him as awesome. Charlie, who is the is Erica's 
um, or Alex's fight promoter. Like you've never seen him before, I think. Like you've oh never my gosh. seen him before. He pulls out an incredible performance. But I mean, everyone does. In the yeah, film. and your so, films so are far, classic like if, for that. Like you watch the trailer, um, everyone's just. Everyone it's, it's, wants it's to be a supporting level. actor, it's, and it's, and he's a supporting actor now. Yeah, it's it's really on an, a whole other level. Yeah. I mean, right across the board, everyone has has put in so much effort, and it's, it's just incredible. Cool, man. So far, well, we really have. appreciate the time. But we only for have the like half the film in the can right now, so. Yep. All right. Well, we'll look for ways that we can support you in the community and financially. I know you're selling some sponsorship for it. Thanks for waiting yep. around today and coming in. Absolutely. Uh, it was important for me to get you guys in. Hey, Chris, we're going to locate that uh, trailer before you go. Lupus just got a trailer for the movie Fight. Uh, We'll get them to load that up. But uh, Anthony Sweet, you better get down here and get your trombone out and get all your everything set up for your little set at 6 o'clock because we're staying on time. I'm Jim Fannin. Thanks again to the cast and crew and some of the producers, actors, and um, the promoters. God, you guys play all the roles here from the movie Fight, Fight Film. Fight. Check it on Facebook, Instagram. Jason Lupish. Yeah, Facebook.com slash Fight Film. I'm Jim Fan, and we'll be right back with Anthony Sweet. Thank you, guys. Thanks for watching the Jim Fannin Show. Jim paid me 20 bucks to say this. Tonight's right. show was produced by Chris Curry. This has been an Earth Bring Sky Water light. production, and you can be anywhere in the world, yet you chose to be with us. Good night. Thank you for that. Paul Brady, all right.